1 Corinthians, good morning, <laughs> sorry. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 10, 6. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 10, 6. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that flowed, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I had to go to the sixth. I apologize. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, so that intent we should not lust after evil things, as also they lusted. Amen. Let's look to the Lord a word of prayer as we can look at this text for us here today. Our fathers, we now have the sacred scriptures in our very possession set before us, that which you've chosen for this day, this hour, for every individual that is in this auditorium. Might you have complete and total liberty that no matter how it is preached, it would still be able to be used to speak to every and each and every heart here today. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, not mine. Thank you that in your divine providence and your omniscience and your foreknowledge and all the things that pertain to who you are, you could take a word of God, a sermon, and transform lives. So help us in this that we would be transformed to the gospel, to have a burden for the lost, and to want to see others come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Well, as we journey with Paul in this passage, this, uh, these three chapters of Scripture, 8, 9, and 10, on the subject of Christian liberty, we find ourselves now in this chapter where Paul is using himself as the example of how to rightly use Christian liberty, freedom in Christ. In our past lessons, we noticed that we have the obligation to be careful of what we do, even though we may, it might be sanctioned and uh, sanctified by God and the Word of God, but in that, there very well could be that there would be malpractice toward another believer. That is the primary concern that Paul has in chapter 8. Chapter 9, his primary concern is the fact that, uh, is that of the ministry of the gospel. Making sure that in his pre-evangelism efforts, he establishes a good, solid relationship with the Jews, with the Gentiles, and with those that are Christians but are still not, have not been able to uh, apply faith toward the Old Testament. And so in uh, chapter 9 and beginning of verse 19 to 23, last week, there was the conduct of the gospel. This morning we wanted to look and take into consideration the crown of the gospel. What is the reward for being faithful in the preaching? And what is Paul's emphasis when he uses the, uh, the illustration or the metaphor of the Olympic Games, beginning of verse 24? Common knowledge, don't you know? We all know that they which run in a race run all, and only one receives the prize. So therefore run that you may obtain. He draws their attention to sports, very common. Every other year would, would have been what were known as the Isthmian Games, and then, the, then uh, what followed that were the, uh, what we know as the Olympics. And, but the, the games there, these were not professional players. These were not professional runners. These were all amateur races. However, it took a tenth month time, 10 months of preparation and a commitment of a good, solid, self-disciplined life. And in the end of all of this, these people would uh, win. They would win a crown. And um, then, but it was, what was even better than the crown was the fact of the fame and the prestige that came with it. Uh, they would have 
been given uh, somewhat of a Im immortalized. In other words, they, they were able to run with the gods and the gods aided and assisted them. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, paganism. There was a lot of religion that was attached to the, to the running. And this was common knowledge to the people back in that day. And so for him to say, you know how these runners, because they would have observed the Olympians training for the big event that was going to take place. And they would have watched them going through their rigorous exercise, their uh, denial in, in their, their diet and their consumption of, and their lack of uh, pleasurable activities and rigorous workout of the body and mind and all of this. And so Paul's going to draw from that, putting into, into, then into the context of what he just stepped out of as far as the thought process into the context of the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the word of God. And so some of the common thought is that he sees himself as one that is a proclaimer, and now he's going to take us into the Olympics, and now we have a, a herald. We have the, the judge. We have the one that says, Here's, here are the games. Here are the competitors. Here are the rules. And so the, the line of thought and the association, there are a lot of parallels between the, the verses that we looked at last week, 19 to 23, and what he gives to us in, in verses 24 to 27. Now what we have to be careful of in, in whenever you take into consideration and a metaphor such as this is set forth, that uh, we do not lose sight of the context in which the, the illustration or the metaphors are placed. The context is Paul himself, and he sets him for, puts him, presents himself as an example to the Corinthian church. And the context is that he wants to make sure that there will be nothing that will hinder the faithfulness of proclaiming uh, the life of Jesus Christ and salvation through faith. He wants to make sure that that faithfulness of his is maintained and that he is willing to give up of all rights and privileges that are, that are his and that also would belong to the Corinthians. And he's willing to surrender that and become a servant and a slave to all. So the redounding uh, refrain is this, I, that I might gain the more, that I might gain them, that I might gain them, by, by all means I might save some. His interest is how many, by whatever means, that are within the context of the Word of God, I can bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Keep that thought in mind, because when we look at running a race, striving for a victory, disciplining the body, it can very easily become a, a locker room, gymnasium type of sermon. And we lose track of what Paul's trying to deliver and what the original tent of the Holy Spirit is in the passage. It's great for sports. And it could be used as an application for teamwork and for dedication and commitment. If I were to use it in the, in the athletic field and say, all right, why are you here? Why are you out here in this sport? You're here to win, right? If you're a hurrier to win, then you must be dedicated to it. You must strive. You must strive to win. You must discipline your body. You must buffet your body. It becomes your slave. And that's what athletics are all about, no matter what the sport is. But we're not in the locker room. We're not in the field. And we are not a sports team. We are Christians. We have the obligation to, to bring forth and share the, the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, we want to find out what it is, what is Paul's emphasis in using the local illustration, this local metaphor, and how is he using it in such a way to drive home a point? So we get to this, these several thoughts. Metaphors in the scripture are mainly two. When you read throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament, there are basically two metaphors that, that the writers use to uh, demonstrate, illustrate the Christian life. One is a warrior, a soldier for the Lord. Put your armor on, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy that, um, that as a, a soldier does not involve himself in the, the things of this life, but rather is, he uh, takes care of his body and surrenders himself to his commanding general in First Timothy chapter 2. Then there is that of the runners. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, uh, let us therefore run and set aside every besetting sin. And let us uh, focus our eyes upon Jesus, who for the, uh, the joy that was set before him endured the cross. 
So you have that image. You have this image of the runner. You have the image of the boxer here in this passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You have another imagery given in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. These metaphors of warriors and runners are used throughout the scripture. So when we look at that, we, we have to ask ourselves questions. For example, we talk about what it is to be a warrior, then a primary question, what is my mission? With any soldier in, involved in warfare, they've got to have a mission. And they have to have an objective, a mission objective. What is it that we want to do? Why am I training? What is my purpose? What will be the goal? What do I expect to accomplish as a warrior for Jesus Christ, for my nation? What constitutes a victory? How do I know when I've won a spiritual battle? How do we know that we have won a, a, a battle in a battlefield? What constitutes a decisive victory? These are questions that uh, as believers in our spiritual lives, uh, in terms of soldier, is who, what is the objective of your warfare in your spiritual life? How do you know that when you won a battle? You go to that of the Olympics as a runner. Sometimes we do not, we just kind of like are just random runners. Paul says, I don't run as uncertainly, but I, and he describes what he does. Which makes me ask the question, if we want to visualize ourselves as Christian athletes, then let's, let's step away from the track and let's go to the objective of anybody that's in the race or as a believer. What do I hope to achieve as a Christian and as, a, as the, having the heart of the runner? What do I hope to achieve? Where is the finish line? What is the finish line in the immediate wind sprint or the long run? How do I know when I've reached certain marker points or plateaus, which would be part of a cross-country run? What constitutes a victory in my Christian life as a runner in the faith? What constitutes that victory? What is the measure of endurance? You see, these are not abstract ideas. Paul doesn't give to us the, uh, the illustration of these, ads, of these uh, athletes so that he can create some more abstract ideas that you're kind of like, well, I'll just take on that badge and that labor label, and I'm a runner for Jesus Christ. I'm a warrior for Christ. But down deep inside, do we know what our objectives are? Do we know what a victory looks like? Do we know what constitutes a victory? How do I know when, when it's decisive? Do I... And, and so we, if we don't have those questions in our heart and we don't seek out those answers, all we are are people that are just running, carrying around a sword, and we have no idea when we're even in battle or when the race even started. So it requires that kind of thought. You see, metaphors are meant to teach lessons. They're meant to teach a lesson. What are lessons meant for? Lessons are meant to change or transform our lives. We know that as parents. Hey, we wanted, I want to teach you a lesson here today. And so your little child or even the students in school, they learned a lesson today. Now in school, they're going to get a letter grade. At home, what do they get? Maybe an attaboy, but what we're at looking for is that the lesson is doing something to change their conduct, their behavior, their way of thinking. And so when we take a look at this, focus, remain focused, that... Jesus, through Paul, the Holy Spirit, is using the language of the Olympic races to transform our lives, to make us into something that we are not. And that something that we are not is that he wants us to be like Jesus or to be like the Apostle Paul himself. So we go to the conclusion of all of these chapters, chapter 11 and verse 1, he wraps it up and summarizes and sets forth the theme that prevails through all of this uh, dissertation and explanation that he gives. Be ye followers of me, as I, even as I also am of Christ. So he says, here is my life. My life is patterned after the life of Jesus Christ. Christ is my example. I follow that example and to such a degree that he's willing and clearly with a conscience that is clear. He says, I want to present to you my life so that you, Corinthian church, you, South Bay Baptist church, can look at the example of this apostle and then examine our own hearts. 
Where am I not owning up to the illustration, to the example of the writer of the text? And that's where we are, we are, where we are at here this morning. To be a follower, but not just to follow in a sense of blindness, but rather by developing these trends, this thought pattern, this passion for the lost that even Paul has. So the, the goal of this chapter in these four verses is to move us from a, an aimless Christianity whereby we have no objective, we have no race, we only know that this is what we're supposed to do. So from an aimless Christianity to a determined, focused living for the proclamation of the gospel. Aimlessness to focus and objective. What is the focus and what is the objective? The preaching of Christ in the neighborhood, in the workplace, to one another, whatever the, the environment might be. So we're still, have, even though there is a break in uh, the subject matter in verse 23, that I might be a partaker with you in the gospel, to 24, you know about athletes. That is not, he's not talking about two separate subjects. He's carrying the subject of his passion for the lost and his self-control and making sure that, that all people, by all means, is, are going to perhaps save some. His interest, the key word is gain, gain, gain. He wants to express that point by the athletic runners. So there are four observations that we make when we uh, work as believers to focus our hearts and our minds on the duty and responsibility to preach the gospel. We pick up from what the athletes do. There are four observations from the athletes who apply to us in the duty to preach the word. The determination of the mind, and I'll repeat these, but it's the determination of the mind, a declaration of intent, the defeat of the body, and the decision of the judge. So you have the determination of the mind, which is going to be in verse 24, the declaration of intent, I fight, verse 25, the defeat of the body, which is verse 26, 27, and then the decision of the judge, which is found in the end of verse 27, I might be a castaway. Four key words are determination, declaration, defeat, and a decision. So let's look at the first one, the determination of the mind. Here Paul says, you know these runners, you know how they train. Everyone runs and they all run to receive a prize. So what, are your, what is our responsibility out of that? Run that you may obtain. The first observation that we make from that is the fact that Paul uh, is making a statement here that everybody is expected to be a participant. Everybody is expected to be a, a competitor. Everybody is expected to be a combatant. Not some of you run, the rest of us will be spectators. So church, run, all of you. And it's not that the, uh, it's not that we're, you know, it's a run so that there's only one rent winner, but rather to have the mind of these runners, the mind of these determined athletes. But everybody participates, everybody is in it. So all of us must so have a mind and a determination that when it comes to the Word of God, the preaching of the cross, in uh, the environment that I am in, that my plans and my intent with the use of liberty is going to be exercised in such a way that I might be able to gain confidence and win some. But it's a planned determination. Without determination, there is no running, there is no race. It's another way of saying this. There is no place for a half-hearted uh, Christianity. There is no place in the competitions, in the Christian life, for self-indulgence. He's redirecting our liberty from, uh, even from sanctified pleasures 
things that are endorsed by God and are beneficial. Redirecting our liberty to that of, of a personal evangelism. Paul is willing to surrender and uh, give up some pleasures and benefits. He gave up his right to receive remuneration from the church so that he might be become all things to all men. And so when you look at this the, with that determination, I've got to have an objective. And he says it, run that you may grasp, that you may obtain. Now, we're going to save that metaphor to the next point. But you've, without a set goal, we talked about this in, in our Sunday school class this morning. If you don't have a goal when it comes to uh, breaking old habits and setting forth new God biblical habits, you're not going anywhere. So we, we have to get past cliches, expressions, and phrases and get down to the uh, the asphalt the cinder track uh the hard stuff and the hard stuff means i must have an objective there's got to be in that then there is the determination of the mind this is what i must do then you move to the de declaration of intent declaration of intent is found in verse 25 and every man that strives for the masteries is temperate in all things now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats into the air. Declaration of intent. What is it? What do we plan to accomplish in the Christian life as an evangelist, as a soul winner? What, what do we plan to accomplish? You know, but without, without that, it's aimless life. It's uh, not without a, a direction, without a goal, without an intention. We see that they have this here. He that strives for the mastery is, the, the phrase there is temperate in all things, encompasses the idea that there are set rules and there is a pattern of life that must be governed and shaped for the purpose of winning the crown winning the olive wreath or winning the uh, um, whatever the, there was one that was laced in with parsley that was very temporary a garland wreath and so but nevertheless what it symbolized and what it made them to be in the sense of being immortalized and all the fame and the prestige that went with it that they knew that there were certain rules and in that there, they had the goal in mind. The objective was to win the crown. Now, in that, there would only be one winner. But in the Christian life, we all strive. Notice that he says, but they do it for corruptible, but we for an incorruptible crown. So in this running, race, competition, the runners run, but not pointless running. There are such things as governing the pace, uh, scheduling that after the fourth lap, and I have four more to go, that we're going to pick up a little bit faster than what we were before. We get down to the uh, seven out of eight, the last lap in a two-mile run. The last lap is dedicated to give more. And then you get in that last half mile, more. And in that last quarter-mile stretch, even more to the point where you fly across the line, it's over. But all of this is calculated. And so in the Christian life, for Paul, he says, I have a calculated plan of how I'm going to minister the truth of the gospel. Our responsibility is when we look at this, is that we, we know what we are trying to accomplish. It has to be done with single-mindedness. Notice that he says that um, I therefore run not as uncertainly. Now he's re speaking about himself, and his running is not in a foot race, but his running, his competition is against himself for preaching of the word. And in that, he's making a statement. It requires a single-mindedness. You know, we're very broad-minded in our thinking and broad-minded in our living, but when it comes to the how is the word of God ever going to get out, 
in, the, in our lives, there must be a single-minded focus. And without that, there are, will not be people that will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, at least not from this church. Somebody else, and somehow or another, God will make sure that they get the word. So it's not aimless, uncertain what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, or without any kind of training. And secondly, in this declaration of intent, is to um, he wants to win the fight against the lust of the flesh. Notice what he says: I so fight I, changing now uh, from the example from the runner to the boxer. I don't fight as one that beats the air. Uh, one might say that that's a, a figure of speech for shadow boxing, which it really is, but we're in the ring. And now when Paul is in the ring, if you've watched any uh, boxing matches or mixed martial arts, these guys just don't go in there like some street kids and just start swinging their arms around. Every blow is calculated with the angle, the approach, looking for the opportunity. And, and the, the boxer deliberately throws the punch at a specific spot. In fact, it is so precise that when we get into verse 27, he says, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. And in this keep under my body, the a literal wording would be, I buffet my body. It's the same speech or speak as the boxer. It, 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 the, uh, it's a reference to a, a blow under the eye, which could be considered almost a knockout punch when with the type of uh, leather-bound uh, metallic-laced gloves that they wore in that day for boxing, it would be a devastating blow. And the point of it is, he's, they're just not swinging and hoping that I hit something, but it's calculated. I have a target, I have an intent, and I have a design. So what do we do with that? Just in that little section alone, here we go. We have a metaphor, we have an illustration, we have a boxer, and he's very intent what he's going to do. Now, how do we use that in our own life? I would suggest to you that there would be um, several targets that we should have in our own life as we want to bring our bodies into subjection and we want to buffet. That is the, 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 the final decisive blow that puts the opponent on his knees. The Bible speaks much of mortification of the flesh and therefore mortify your members which are in the body, evil concupiscence and adulterous thoughts and, and the list goes on. First John, um, John writes this, that the, uh, the temptations of the flesh are the lust of the eye the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. In other passages of Scripture, we have on subjects of laziness, overindulgence, apathy, excuses. These are the target areas that hinder the proclamation of the gospel. They rob us of the, the earnestness and the desire to want to see somebody else or have somebody else hear the word of God. And so to, to properly apply the text means that there must be personal objectives, target areas in my own life that are going to hinder, not running, but hinder the teaching and the preaching and the pre-evangelism, the relationship level, or even speaking the word right out. What are those things that get in the way? Target, intent, declaration of intent. So we looked at the determination of the runner. He's determined that he's going to obtain the prize. He's determined that there's nothing going to hinder and get in his way. We have the declaration of intent. I'm, there is an objective. There is a goal. I have target. I want to bring the enemy down. I want to win, and it's a battle against the flesh. Paul's now, now slowly taking this into the body seems to be the problem. It's not the other guy. It's not the circumstances. It's not the law, the land. It's, it's not Supreme Court. The real problem is going to be with our own physical bodies and our own physical appetites. So we move to the defeat of the body in verse 27. What does he say? I keep, or that is, I buffet my body, and I bring it into subjection. So the imagery is the boxer, the calculated blow. But what's 
not expressed in, um, in the King James, and I think there's only one other translation that gives it its full strength, is this phrase, and bring it into subjection. That is, now that the, the, the body, the mind over the body, he strikes this fatal blow. No, fatal is not the word we want to use right now. A decisive blow, crippling blow. And in this crippling blow to the body, he says, I now, the body becomes a slave to my mind and to the Holy Spirit. Your physical body with its emotions, with its passions, its fleshly desires, whatever they might be, even those things which could be right, sanctified, and safe. But when it comes to they, they, even that might become a hindrance to speaking and talking the truth of the Word of God to an unbeliever and bringing them to Jesus Christ, as Paul says, the body must be brought into subjection. Total subjection. It raises the question, am I a slave to my body or is my body slave to me? To be right about it, he said, church, Corinth, me, South Bay Baptist, bring your body so that it is your slave. You lead it around. It doesn't lead you around. Now, that is not to say that uh, when we eat food, you know, we, we develop an appetite. It's wrong that all of a sudden we're going to go to the cupboard and eat food. That's, that's not what this is about. Let's not get hung up on on uh, peripherals of the illustration that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. There are many things that uh, bodily appetites that God endorses and tells us to do. Marriage life in the physical realm, a lot of that is there. What he's talking about is that when those, when those passions, and then there are those illicit passions and desires that get in the way, that where we, we surrender to that. Now we are slaves to our own physical appetites. That's what hinders the preaching of the gospel. That's what hinders faithfulness. Paul wants to be found faithful. God wants us to be found faithful. That in opportunities and plans and intentions and determinations, we're faithful to make it our goal to let people know that Jesus died for their sins, that he's, he died in their place. He took their place. He is their substitute. Not as a temporary game player, but as one that took upon themselves all the wrath of God. And he willingly and freely, when you exercise faith and believe and, believe and trust in that, he will give to you his righteousness. He will guarantee to you that eternal life and a transformed life, renewed. See, that's the message. Paul says, let us be found faithful in this. And in order to do that, we must be determined. We must have a, an intentional declaration of here's what my plans are how I'm going to do it and then to the defeat of the body which is the major stumbling block in all of this it, it goes without saying that this is not something that we do apart by of God's grace the ministry of the Holy Spirit you go to chapter 15 of the same book excuse me chapter uh, uh, in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says that he is the, the least of all the apostles. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. But it's not I, but the grace of God that is in me. And so he works hard. He says, I work harder and above all the rest, but I'm not doing the work, but it's by God's grace. And that would be applied to this. You're not going to destroy the passions of the body and, and uh, determine what it's going to do w apart from God's grace, apart from the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have to bring that in. It has to be brought in by way of mention as a, as a fundamental, as an article of our faith and our belief system and as individuals. Otherwise, we just become athletes. We treat the Christian life in a, in a very ironclad fashion. And it's, it's by self-determination, self-will. Whereas God wants it to be a, the working in and through us to accomplish his good will and his good pleasure. So we've, 
Now look at verse 27, where we see that there was the defeat of the body. And the last point is this, there is the decision of the judge. It's a strange conclusion by itself. What does it have to do with evangelism? Now, it would have a lot to do if uh, we were just runners, because he says, lest by any means when I have preached, the word there for preached is the same word that is used for as a herald. And so we are now at the Olympics. We are at Corinth. And uh, here is the, the announcer. And the announcer says, here are the names of the runners and here are the rules of the game. You will run so many laps. Here is the attire that you can wear. And, and here is the, the kind of glove that you can put on if you're in the boxing and all the different events. So the herald would explain the rules. He would start the race. Paul borrows that word. The herald would also serve as the judge. So while the judge at the Olympics is the one that makes the statement, he starts the race, he determines who the winner is and who qualifies to run the race and who is disqualified. For whatever the reason might be, there's a problem, there's a possibility that the best of the athletes could run that race, go across the line, and only to hear the words, you are disqualified. Now, that would be in the Olympics. But he draws from that illustration and applies it to himself. Very strange. Like, come on. Here is the writer of a large part of the New Testament here is a man that has a face-to-face -face confrontation with uh, Jesus Christ himself, made an apostle, and builds churches, suffers for Jesus, shipwrecked, beaten three times, 39 times each, submits himself to, to uh, Jewish purification so that he can win them. I mean, this guy's got it all over us. But his fear is, lest when I have heralded to others, I myself should be a castaway, that I might be judged as disqualified. We have to take a close look at this. You see here, there's one of two possibilities. Is Paul making a statement that says that if, if in my race as a Christian, I fail to run wholeheartedly with determination and intent and a defeat of the body, that the judge could say that you are not qualified in the end to receive the incorruptible crown. You are disqualified from heaven. Is that his question? Now, there are some writers that would say that Paul is making an explicit statement here that as Christians, if we fail to run a rigorous race in the Christian life, disciplining our bodies, surrendering ourselves to the, to the Spirit of God, and being uh, soul winners, that in the end we may do all of this in vain only to find out that we have been disqualified. Not from the crown, but from entrance into heaven. Well, the, there's a problem with that. If we think that way, if we follow that line of thought, so again, just staying within the context, the weight of one's salvation is decided then by your faithfulness in preaching the gospel. That if you follow that, Paul is at risk of losing his salvation. His salvation now is determined by his works as a faithful herald of the word of God and the knowledge of Jesus saves. I don't believe that that's what it is. Not because, and I'll tell you why, because what we have are crowns issued for faithfulness, but it's at the end of the race. You go to chapter 3 of our text, there is a final judgment, and in that final judgment, every man's works are going to be brought before God to see what manner, how do they qualify, and there will be works that will surrender to the test of fire, and, and just be all go up in smoke, and then there will be those works, but every man's work will be judged, but all of these Christians will be saved, yet so as by fire. So yeah, it's going to be tight. But it's not the 
goodness of the works or the failure of the works that decides. That's made quite clear. Chapter 4, in the first several verses of chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, Paul questions his own uh, judgment of his spiritual life. This is closer to what we're dealing with. There he questions, have I been a faithful steward? Only God knows the measure of my faithfulness. I might have skewed the results or implanted an attitude that isn't really what God wanted. But he says, I send myself to the judge. God will determine my stewardship, whether I did well or I did not. But that has to do with as a steward, as a servant. Here, the being um, that I should be a castabate or be rejected, Paul's primary concern is this, and this is what he wants us to be really thoughtful of. He worked so hard and he planned so much, but you know, he never assumed that he was going to get the crown. He never assumed that he was going to have that incorruptible wreath. It was not his assumption. He, uh, he assumed that he was always at risk, that he didn't do it hard enough. He was not faithful enough. When you look at the life of Paul, you, you know, if we were to talk to Paul and say, Paul, don't be thinking that way. That's, that's bad stuff, man. You're going to ruin your self-esteem. You can't be thinking that you didn't work hard enough. I mean, we tell people that, don't talk that way. You work hard. We watch you work. Paul would be standing beside you. Whoa, stop. Wait a minute. Did you really work that hard? Who's making the call here? If you want to judge yourself, then everybody has their own standard of what decides faithfulness to the preaching of the gospel. His risk was, I may be disqualified because I was not faithful as I thought I was. God who judges righteously, he might make a decision of disqualification, and so I get no crown. So let us not think for a moment that if we hand out a track or if we happen to say, uh, hey, Jesus loves you, or I look for the opportunity to witness it never came about, and on and on it goes, and we really never sat down and planned it out with a definitive objective, with the defeat of the body, the passions of the flesh, for the intent of preaching the word of God. Don't expect for a moment that you're going to get a crown. We need to hear this very carefully. And it's all in the context of Christian liberty. Remember, liberty designed for service, for slavery, for others, Jew, Gentile, and weak Christians. So that's the, that's the emphasis that he says, follow me. Now he wants you to pick up on follow his mindset, his fear, his concern, his possible exasperation. Have we ever gone to that level? That at the end of a day, at the end of a week or a month, we look back and we look at our track record and say, you know, I don't, I don't recall once where I would, even took the courage or the boldness to, to say, here, I want you to read this, at the least. And yet, we'll read a passage like this and say, I'm a runner. I'm a warrior for Jesus. And Paul, imagine Paul sits down with you and he says, Really? How many times did, were you whooped? How many times were you in prison? How many times did you have to give up something that you cherished and would gladly have received, but you did it because you only had in mind a, a way or a means that you could gain somebody's confidence to bring them to Jesus Christ? And then the final thought on this, because I had Charlie read in the chapter 10, is found in verse 6. Now, these things were our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. You see, in verse 1 of chapter 10, moreover, and in a lot of renditions it says, for brethren, I would, I would not want you to be ignorant. And when you read what took place, here are uh, people that were liberated, as the Christian is. They are liberated, but in the end, with that liberty and in Christ baptized, identified with Jesus Christ, with Moses, and all of these different means, what happened? What happened is they turned back to their old habits, their old ways, and God was not pleased with them. They were disqualified. 24 to 27 is a transition. 
He makes the point, the emphasis on being faithful in the preaching of the gospel to win that incorruptible crown, but don't take it for granted that you're going to get it. Be fear, be concerned, use that as the impetus to work harder, but at the same time, apart from the gospel, is now we go back to our Christian liberty. If we are abusing our liberty in Christ with sanctioned, sanctified activities, we may be and could very well be at risk of deferring ourselves away from faithfulness to Jesus Christ and begin to indulge in the pleasures of life, the flesh, and of the world. And when you put it into the context of what, of, because he talks about idolatry and eating of these meals, I believe, just not getting too far ahead of ourselves, that he says, you have liberty, but that liberty could be your very downfall. It could be your very downfall. And so disqualified is the key word, verse 27, that moves us immediately into the first six verses of chapter 10. And in verse 6, God was not well pleased. It's a illustration from the Old Testament of a disqualified people because they failed to rightly use the liberty that they had in Jesus Christ as a liberated people from the bondage of sin in Egypt. So two thoughts that we leave here with. Number one, or three comments is this. Evangelism is serious because it decides whether or not we receive the crown. The judge is serious about how we treat the propagation of the gospel because we are at risk of being disqualified or rejected from receiving any kind of award or reward. And thirdly, Christian liberty is serious because we risk into a relapse. Evangelism is a serious crowns. The judge is serious rejection. Christian liberty is serious a relapse. Here's your question to take home. Liberty is about training to win the lost. Are you going through a spiritual training exercise to prepare and think through means by which we can gain the more to win some? Liberty is about training my mind and my body to this service. So I train to win train the body for this purpose and I ask you then is this is that your race is that our race as a church as a pastor as a people is this race of faithfulness and proclamation and how we use our liberty to find our way into homes and friends and people not violating the word of God still under the law of Christ so that we can gain an opportunity, an opening, and with the whole intent to to gain that we might save some. So Paul says, there's a judge that's watching what we do, and if you're not practicing that kind of determination, you are at risk of being as Israel and to be disqualified um, and face the, the discipline of God. You relapse back into your former lifestyle. So, Father, we pray, help us. Help us, Lord, in the, in the one area that was the, the sole burden and the passion of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He surrendered his own body to give it over to the purpose of your Son in salvation and redemption. We pray that you would guide us and help us to be faithful in this calling and this duty. Give us boldness, courage, and strength the mind of the determination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.